So I hope uh, you're still bearing with me and uh, with the environmental engineering, which finally we can say that is, uh, it all started in civil engineering. So we deal with the same procedures. We also calculate uh, velocity fields, and then we add an extra dimension. We put some pollutants there, and uh, then we are searching the transport. And of course, we also add some, some uh, biogeochemical transformations also. So here's the agenda. I will tell something about the problems and the challenges with this uh, sophisticated environmental models that we are dealing with and uh, the intertwinement between the data, the models, and uh, the mass balances, which uh, we found to be a very useful tool uh, when we are challenged with uh, how to cope with uh, uh, differences or, let's say, gaps between the, between the results that we get from measurements and from the modeling. So what is the problem? We are developing and using uh, more and more sophisticated environmental models, and we are doing uh, multidimensional modeling of, uh, let's say, everything. So we start with the advection, and then we do the dispersion, and uh, when we have the velocity fields and we know about the mixing, then we do the transport and the fluxes. And then we try to also to calculate some transformations, so the changes of state or some transformations from one species, chemical from, from the other. And we are working in a multitude of compartments because uh, we're not only working in the water, but we also add the atmosphere and uh, sometimes uh, even the water can be, uh, can be uh, split apart into a few compartments. And then what we are doing within a compartment, when this compartment is huge or when we have to deal with uh, some details, we do some grid nesting. And uh, here we, we are faced with a multitude of scales. The domain can be of the scale of uh, a million meters, so 10 million meters, this is 10,000 kilometers. And then we put inside a relatively small, fine grid and uh, we even need to put a finer grid if we want to do the biogeochemistry. So how to cross over these, uh, these uh, scales? So we are faced with many challenges. It is the grid size versus the computational time. Of course, you know, when we uh, refine the grid, uh, the, time, the computational time does not increase linearly, but rather exponentially. Then is the quantity and quality of the input data, because we never have enough data, the modelers, of course, and the experimentalists who go to the field and measure, they say they cannot provide more, particularly not for the money we give them. And then there is a challenge of the data assimilation, so how to assimilate the measured data into the models and to get uh, an, an ensemble. Uh, how to, what are the, the correct coupling or the nesting procedures. How do we interpret the results? What's the reliability across the scales? And of course, we are always trying to do some improvement. And why is this crucial? Because we are making decisions on the basis of our models of the modeling results. So the remediation measures depend on the results of the models. And sometimes even the we are making policy, we are writing laws, we are writing legislation on the basis of the, of the models. So if I show the methodology that is usually used, we are dealing, let's say, in two principles. Uh, in any case, the demand on measured data is increasing drastically. But there are mostly two approaches. So the first one is that uh, we have a, a set of data which we can use for everything, for the input data, to assimilate them, to do the verification and calibration, and finally the validation of the results. And uh, whoever tried to do any kind of environmental modeling was usually faced with that, that the model was done after the data were collected. So we use the data that we have. And uh, then we usually have the problem with the adequacy and uh, quantity of data, and uh, we can give the feedback back to the experimentalists, to the people who go to the field and collect this data for us. And then there's the, another approach which we also 
have uh, tested a few times. So uh, the model was conceived before uh, the data were collected. This was actually a very good idea from the viewpoint of a modeler, but uh, it uh, made uh, gray hair to people who were collecting the, the data. So when we requested the data, when we faced them with the parameters, with the accuracy, with the temporal and spatial resolution of the data that we would need for the models, they just told us that this is, this is impossible. Or if not impossible, it's far too expensive. So we got the feedback. And uh, again, we, we communicate. And even in the case of perfect communication, we are usually limited. We are limited with the size of the domain that we are modeling. So here we did uh, some uh, modeling on the Mediterranean Sea, the entire Mediterranean Sea all at once. And this is a huge domain. And uh, well, of course, you cannot have the measurements everywhere. You cannot have time series. And uh, these measurements are not uh, performed at the same time, of course. If you're measuring with a single ship in the Mediterranean, then you need a four-dimensional model, actually, because uh, the uh, gap, not the gap, but the, the time lag between the, between the measurements in the eastern and the western Mediterranean is at least a few weeks. And then the, there's the project budget. That's, that's, always, the, that's always the problem. But uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, there you can have also other limitations. So one is the weather conditions. When you go to the sea and you try to do some measurements, you, you're on a uh, vessel, you do the cruise, and uh, then you return with five or six profiles within three weeks because the weather was bad. And Badly. then the final limitation is the, let's say, the computational limitation because we are limited with the computational time. So regardless of money spent, regardless of time spent, we are always, we do have some limitations. And uh, then then again, what's the reliability of the method? So even if we have a very good communication, if we, if we have an adequate amount of relatively high quality data, then we perform measurements, uh, not, we perform computations. And then the computations are done by two sorts of people. The ones that were collecting the samples, they usually use less uh, complicated methods to get the results, and we use the models. And then there's the gap between the models and the, and the and measurements. So here you can see this is a thing that we were uh, doing for many years. So uh, evasion of mercury from the Mediterranean Sea. And the results are quite different in tons per year. So you can see there's a not only, uh, uh, it's not uh, some 30, 40%. This is twofold, or even sometimes it's threefold <coughs> higher uh, value, higher quantity uh, calculated from measurements than from the models. So now we ask ourselves which finally are more reliable, either the sophisticated models we're using or the high tech measurements, what's, what's better? Well, then we can introduce the mass balance. So it's not only the measurements and the modeling we, we are dealing with, but we can do the mass balance, which usually we feed with all the data from both, from models, from measurements, and then we get the info, we get the feedback, and we can do some improvements in this way. So what we did in the Mediterranean was this, let's say, provisional mass balance, where we put all the numbers inside, and then in the end we, we decided that it's no use of uh, any very uh, high-tech uh, biogeochemical modeling because uh, this mass balance is not closed. So we had a huge gap between the inputs and outputs. And so we decided that we need to improve this first before we do any more modeling. It is useless to argue who is better, the experimentalists or the modelers, when we have uh, a huge gap all using all our data. So what, what is there, what needs to be asked when you perform a mass balance? First of all, are the sources and things balanced? Well, if yes, then it's OK. Then the relevance of the measurements of the models are, is confirmed. If not, then we have to ask ourselves why. So what's going on? Why do we have a trend line in concentrations? This can be good. 
Of course, when the concentration is decreasing, so if we look at this mass balance, then the net outflow of 24 tons per year would mean that uh, the quality of water, so the concentrations of mercury are decreasing. Decreasing with a 2.4, 2 2.2% per year. So if it goes exponentially in 50 years, there would, no be, there would be no more mercury problem in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Uh, the concentrations would decrease for 30, 40 percent, and uh, we can just forget about putting some new legislation or providing some measures. But this is not, this is not correct, because uh, we know that this is more or less impossible. There are also natural sources, so it's something that is more or less in, in, in the equilibrium. So when the mass balance is not balanced, do we understand? Do we understand the sources and the sinks? Do we understand the transport processes? What, do, what are we missing? And when we ask our questions, we can get some very important answers which can be used in further modeling and in further collecting of data. So which of these processes are crucial? Which additional measurements do we need? And uh, for the modelers, this one is very important. So which model of the model needs to be improved first? What's the, what's the priority of the, of the improvements? So then again, which other models should be coupled to the existing ensemble? We are dealing, sometimes we are only using one model in the water compartment. Are we, is this okay? So what about this exchange? Do we need to apply a model for the atmosphere and calculate the exchange with the coupled models or not? Or the sediment models or whatever, whatever we need. And uh, then again, the, the, the details about the grid nesting or which data sets should be used for validation. So we learned a few things and uh, we did an improved, we improved the model, we performed more measurements and in a few years uh, we lowered the gap so uh, in this mass balance significantly. So this is uh, what we did, we introduced new compartments in the water. We introduced new processes because new compartments, they uh, just implied that new processes should be needed because uh, there's transport between these new, new, pro new, new compartments. And uh, the final result is that uh, we really significantly reduced the gap. We also introduced a new species, so we were not dealing only with the total mercury, but also with the methyl mercury, which is crucial for the uh, for human health and for the environmental status. And uh, we ended with a mass balance that was uh, more or less more or less closed. So yes, definitely there is uh, a decrease in mercury concentrations in the Mediterranean, but as you can see in this mass balance it is much lower than we uh, calculated several years before in this preliminary one. So what are we actually doing? This is not the only established mercury mass balance. We did a few and all of those helped in understanding the processes, in improving the models and of course in determining the additional measurements that were needed to improve this uh, let's say, measurement, modeling, mass balance, intertwinement. So this is the declaration statement. So it can be helped even if we have an insufficient quantity of measurements, even if we have unsatisfactory accuracy of environmental models, this could be helped with a good mass balance. We prove this. Thank you very much. Thank you.